I'm going to share today. Um, I have no notes. Um, I'm really shooting from the hip here. Pastor Hopkins is here, and I was like, oh, my word. I, I, I got I to, you know, I, I, I want to. But, but more, than, more than Pastor Hopkins and, and more than my church family, I want to be faithful to what Jesus Christ is teaching me and share that. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your Holy Spirit. I thank you that you teach us. And for all the time of reading and prepping and praying and seeking you in the other message, this is the one that's on my heart today. And so I ask God today that just in our time together, that you would speak truth to us all. I, I thank God throughout this congregation, if there's anyone here today, Lord, that doesn't know you as Lord and Savior of their lives, Father, if they've never come to a place where they've surrendered and accepted the gift of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of their sins, Father, I pray that today would be that day. I pray, God, for each one here. I'm sure there are those who are on the mountaintops, and I'm sure there are those who are in the valleys, and I'm sure there are those everywhere in between. Father, give us life anew. Fill us, Father, with your spirit. And as you do, God, may you do a work today that would bring great honor and glory to your name and your name alone. So, Father, be our teacher. Bring your Holy Spirit on us today and in this moment. We give you this time. In your name we pray. Amen. Open your Bibles, if you will, to Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53. If you know anything about this section of Isaiah, um, as, as you're turning in the Old Testament, um, uh, it begins, this section begins in Isaiah 52, verse 13, and goes to the end of Isaiah 53. And we often read this passage and hear this uh, taught and read during the time of uh, um, Easter, uh, leading up to uh, the Passion Week and, and the sacrifice that Christ made on the cross for us. And when you read it, um, beginning in Isaiah 52, beginning in verse 13, uh, it, it says, Behold, I'm reading from the ESV, it's the Bible I grabbed this morning. Behold, my servant shall act wisely or shall prosper, the New Living Translation says, I believe. Um, he shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. As many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the children of mankind, and so shall he sprinkle many nations. And again, so this is Jewish people are reading this, but many nations would look at the Gentiles, the non-Jewish world, and as a Gentile, I'm thankful for that phrase. He continues, uh, kings shall shut their mouths because of him, for that which has not been told them they see, and that which they have not heard they understand. And then chapter 53 continues this, and, and it's a picture of, we look at it and see it as a picture of the Messiah. But for the Jewish people, they reject reading this as messianic. In fact, I've, I've heard told that J many Jewish people will not even read this section of Scripture because it is so contrary to their picture and image of what Messiah should be. And we understand that because look at verse 53, chapter 53, verse 1. Who has believed, excuse me, who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before you like a young plant. Again, we, we hear this and we're like, Jesus grew up. We read that in John. He grew in stature and wisdom. He grew up before you uh, like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. 
He had no form or majesty that we should look on him and no beauty that we should desire him. I, I know that the pictures we see of Jesus, he's walking around uh, wearing a white robe, like really white, and there's this oh, glow around him. But I don't think that's real. I don't think that was it. Because if it was, everybody would have seen him and been like, dude, there's something different about that guy. No, he looked just like everybody else did. No beauty that we should desire him. And then look at verse 3. He was despised and rejected by men. <sighs> he was despised and rejected by men. Not, not just men, but rejected by his own people. He was a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. I, I sometimes think, how, how was Jesus a man of sorrows? How is Jesus a man of sorrows? I, I'm, I'm a new grandpa. Well, not new, but grandpa times two. And while, while my grandson was being born, I'm getting updates of all the junk going on in the world. And I have a heaviness of my heart of realizing what kind of world my grandson was just born into. Anybody with me on that? Amen? When... When I have a chance to talk to my church family or the folks in our community and I hear the struggles that you're going through, and some of them, we go through stuff because we've made bad decisions. At least I have. I'm sure none of you guys are in that situation. And, and sometimes, sometimes we are going through bad stuff because we just live in a fallen world and the enemy wants to kill us and destroy us any way he can. There's a heaviness and a sorrow in my heart when I see the effects of sin on God's people. And I, and I got to believe that as Jesus wept as he was going into Jerusalem, this was part of it. As he was a man of sorrow, a man of grief, I've got to believe that, that it was seeing all the potential that his people had, all the potential that the Jewish people had, and for so many of them, they turned and walked away from it and did their own thing. And I have to tell you that as a pastor, there is a heaviness in my heart because I see the potential of our church family. And this is not pointing fingers at anybody. It's just we grow, we work through things. And I am in a place I look back and say, man, I wish I would have learned this and known this years ago. I would have saved myself so much grief and hassle. And I look at some of you and I think, I pray that you will get it and understand it and continue to grow and move beyond that. But we are all, this is not me saying you, this is saying us. This is saying us. But as the picture is drawn here of Jesus, that he was a man of sorrows and certainly was acquainted with grief. It goes on and says, and as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteem him not. I have had situations and opportunities where I have been with people who knew that I knew their backstory. I've been in situations when I was with people that knew the sin I was in the middle of or, or dealing with, and I, I couldn't even look them in the face. Anybody ever been there with me? And so I got to believe that as the Son of God, who was teaching everything that we've been reading in Matthew of the Sermon on the Mount and the teaching that he's giving to the people, when Jesus looked into a heart, when he looked into the eyes of someone, the woman at the well, the one who washed his feet, the, the Judas, when he looked into Judas's eyes, when he looked into Peter's eyes, the, the Gospel of Luke says that when Peter denied Jesus the third time, he turned and he looked and Jesus looked at him. Can, can you imagine that? So, so when he says that, when he says as one from whom men hide their faces, it says Peter, Peter left and wept. 
He went out and wept. I, I bet he did. I'll bet he did. We do a good job of putting on masks, don't we? We were visiting a, a store um, that has a bunch of costume Halloween stuff out, and there was masks all over the place. And I looked at it, and I thought, I, I don't need one of those masks. I've got, all, I got enough already. That we put a mask on, and we hide behind it, that our world is all together. Can we just admit our world is not together? Our lives are not together. Our hearts are not where they need to be, and we are a mess. And yet we put on a happy face and we think, yay, I've got it together. And meanwhile, inside we are broken. Well, well maybe, maybe we're not broken. Maybe we're needy, but we don't want to admit it because of our pride. And Jesus wants to take us to a place of being broken that we recognize our sin and what it has done. Look at verse 4. This is my focus, verses 4, 5, and 6. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. What grief are you carrying today? What is the grief and the heaviness of your heart? He he bore that on the cross. He took that on himself. And if you're here today, and I know some are, that you're carrying the weight of this on your shoulders, give it to Jesus. Give it to Jesus. Verse 5. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was wounded for our, for our sin. He was wounded for our shortcomings. He was wounded because of our rebellion against God. He was crushed because of our iniquities. Each one of us have times when we come up short, and each one of us have times when we flat out defy the living God. And it's because of my transgressions, because of, because of my transgressions, because of my iniquities, that our Savior was wounded and crushed on the cross. We're going to celebrate communion. But it's, it, please, please, friends, do not just eat the bread and drink the juice and go about your way. that he was wounded for my transgressions. I was talking to Annalise earlier that um, when when Jonathan was born, we were down in Kentucky, and uh, uh, he was born, and the nurses was like, oh, Dad, would you like to cut the umbilical cord? And I was like, oh, no. No, I don't. I don't want to do anything that would hurt my son. Now I realize some of you are like, it doesn't, they don't feel things, it's fine. I, I don't care. I learn more about God's love for me standing in that delivery room when Jonathan was born than in all the Sunday school lessons combined. Parents, you understand what I'm talking about. And as grandpa, <laughs> I don't want anything to happen to my grandson. And yet, yet God because he loved you and me, was so willing to say the only way we can make this right, that he planned before the foundation of the earth was to send his son Jesus, not to to get a slap on the wrist, but to die a criminal's death on the cross for you and for me. I say you because I want you to understand it, but I'm just, I am set apart. I am set aside and broken just realizing what he did, what he did for me. He was wounded for our transgressions. When we take the bread, and I tear out on me to steal your thunder, you're going to be doing communion, but when we take that bread, it's all nice and neat. His body was broken so that we could be one with God and we could be one with each other. 
he was crushed like like a grape that the the grape is the body is left and the juice comes out to make the juice or the wine Christ sacrificed and gave himself wholly and fully for you and for me that while we were yet sinners Christ died for us when we were at our worst Christ died for us that that amazes me and upon him he continues upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace the peace of God that passes all understanding was given to me undeserved because Christ paid the price for it he gives me peace He gives me peace that I don't deserve, but I need. He gives you peace. He can give you peace that you need and you don't deserve. And Christ paid the price in full for that as well. And with his stripes, we're healed. With his stripes, he was beaten to a pulp. I can't even imagine the cat of nine tails with the handle and the leather straps and the glass and the, the rocks and the, the metal and the, the jagged edge stuff that they'd, they'd whip across the back of our Savior for my sin, my sin that I'm really comfortable with. And then I wonder why the Spirit of God doesn't move in my life the way that it should. is because I take lightly the sacrifice of Christ on the cross for me. His stripes, every one of them, psh, rip around his body and rip the skin off his, off his own body. The body that he willingly laid down for you and for me. And it's through that that there is healing. And yet in the middle of that, in the middle of that opportunity, so often we stand there and say, no, no, I'm good. No, no, I'm good. I got this. I'm okay. I think I can figure this out on my own. Friends, we cannot figure out a second of our lives on our own. We need Jesus each and every day. Can I get an amen? If you need a healing today, the healing is not in the doctors. No offense to the doctors in the medical community. If you need a healing for our country, it's not in our politicians. No offense to the politicians Friends, we need a healing from Jesus Christ, and it needs to start first and foremost when you and I surrender our hearts and lives and accept what Christ did for us on the cross as the full payment for our sins. Only then can we have the peace of God. Only then can we be healed and forgiven. And then verse 6, it gets better and worse at the same time. All we like sheep have gone astray. Everybody participate with me on this real quick. My granddaughter is learning sheep animal sounds or animal sounds right now. She'll do an elephant and a pig. The best one, though, the best one, though, is a deer. She does this. She's going to be a bow hunter. I'm just absolutely certain of it. We are sheep. I need everybody in good granddaughter, grandson ask. Let's do sheep noise. Bah! We, we are sheep. Left to our own devices, we will wander away from the shepherd, trying to find something else that might be better than what the shepherd has for us. We are sheep. And so after this picture of describing what the Messiah has gone through, he says, but yet all we like sheep have gone astray. And we have turned. I love how the ESV is. We have turned everyone. Don't don't think that, well, I'm excluded. I haven't turned. All of us have done this. All have sinned, Romans says, and fall short of the glory of God. He says, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And I got to tell you, folks, I'll pause there. When I am turned to my own direction and my own bent, I am led away by my own evil desires, my own sinful desires. And so if I, as a sheep, am going after my own way, there's nothing good that comes from that. We've turned everyone to his own way. And again, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. God laid on his own son 
the punishment and the payment for all of our sins. All of us. The question is whether you will accept it and receive it for yourself or not. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. There will be, there will be those who step into eternity who have heard this message or one like this who will say, I choose not to receive the gift that's been given to me and I choose to go my own way and do it on my own. And friends, if that is you, when you breathe your last, unless something changes, when you breathe your last, you'll step into a godless eternity that was meant for the demons and for Satan and for those who oppose God. We have that choice. We have that choice. The Lord laid on Christ my sin. What sin do you struggle with the most? I'm not asking you to name it out loud, but as you think about what is it that you deal with the most, I just got an email from the Allens. Bart and Emily said that they were, um, that the word of God is being, uh, is, is working in their community. And there was a gentleman who is a Christian who acted in a way that is completely accepted by the Omdu people but it's completely contrary to the word of God. And as he got home, he began realizing what he had done and he came to his fellow brothers and sisters in Christ and repented of his sin for what he had done against the other people that was not consistent with God's word. Why? Because God's word makes a difference in hearts and lives. And that's why we, and that's why we read it. That's why we study it. That's why we go through and try to memorize it and work it into our hearts and lives. Why? Because when the word of God is planted in your heart and in mine, the Holy Spirit then has something to work with and to teach us and to change us. Turn your Bibles, we'll close with this, to Romans 6, 23. Romans 6, 23. These are the two passages that just kept pouring through my heart as I was going to visit this man, Romans 6, 23. We read again from the apostle Paul, he says, for the wages of sin is death. And so don't turn back, but I'll just remind you of the number of times that he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity or the sin of us all. So in Romans 6, 23, The wages of sin, of transgressions, of iniquity, it's death. That's it. And and, and if it ended right there, if, if instead of a comma, it was a period, the wages of sin is death, period, we would have no hope. But there's a comma and there's a but. It says, but wait, 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 don't, don't lose hope yet, but the free gift or the unearned gift of God is eternal life. How? in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Because he took on him, back to Isaiah, the stripes, the beatings, the bruisings, the wounds, and by his wounds, by his stripes, we are healed and we have the opportunity to be forgiven. My question for you today is, do you know Jesus Christ as your savior? Not do you know about him, not can you recite the story, well, Jesus was born in a manger so many years ago. I'm not, I'm not talking about that. He died on a cross. You can theoretically say it. I'm saying, have, has there been a point in time in your life where you have said, I no longer am going to walk my own way. I am going to accept what Christ did for me because I am dead in my trespasses and sin. And I can't do this. Sin separates us from God, but God made a way when he sent his son, his only son, Jesus, to die on a cross for you and for me. Friends, the wages of sin is death, but it doesn't have to stop there. Jesus Christ died for your sins and for mine and made a way for you to be forgiving. And it is a free gift and unearned. There's nothing you can do to get in the good graces of God. It is a matter of placing our faith, our believing faith in what the work of Jesus Christ and accepting his full payment for our sin, full payment for our sin and walk in newness of life. Will you bow with me in prayer?
Friends, if you're here today and you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, I would ask, is the Holy Spirit pricking your heart and talking to you today? Friends, there's, there is one thing of both the saved and the unsaved that step into eternity. Every one of them wants their friends and family to come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. We see that with the rich man. He said, please send somebody back and tell my brothers I don't want them to endure this torment. And we know the saved want us there. The question is, will you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior today? It might be in a prayer similar to this, but if you just say the words but don't mean it, then don't waste your breath. But you might pray and believe this, dear God, I am a sinner, and my sin has separated me from you. But I know that Jesus was bruised for my sin. He was wounded for my iniquities. And I know he paid the full price for my sins, and I receive that full payment today. I believe that Jesus died and was buried and rose again as he said he would, conquering sin and conquering death, and someday he's coming back. God, forgive me and save me. Thank you. Father, today I pray for each one of us here. Wherever we find ourselves, if there's a new believer, I pray, God, that they would be able to walk in newness of life that you have given them because of Jesus Christ. And as we come around this Lord's table, the Lord's Supper today, may you anoint this time in a way you never have in the past and unify us and bind us together as a body in ways you never have before for your glory and your praise. It's in the name of Jesus we pray these things. Amen.